So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends. It's my honor to welcome you to the very first Manage Energy Talk. My name is Christiane Ecker. I work for the Regional Energy Agency of Upper Austria, and I have the pleasure to be your moderator today. What is this event about? You may have wondered, uh, a new format. It's about the role and contribution of the regional and local level to what all the week is about, the energy transition. And we all have gathered here at the Yusef to discuss the energy transition, and not just any energy transition, but the energy transition that makes most of it for people, prosperity, and planet. The energy transition that we want is not only measured in gigawatt replaced or in CO2 saved, that is the basis and remains critically important, but it's also measured in people's lives that we have improved by making the air cleaner, by making the buildings healthier, the jobs we create through innovation, or the investments we trigger in sustainable energy solutions. And because this kind of energy transition is not only about replacing one energy source or one technology by another, the local and regional level is so important. It is about millions of people, citizens, businesses, public bodies, everybody, changing their habits and changing their investments. Manage Energy is a commission initiative that recognizes this fact that we need to involve everyone. And it places key importance on us, the local and regional energy agency in Europe. Local and regional energy agencies are organizations with a mandate by the city, the region, or another public body to promote sustainable energy in their territory. In Europe, there are over 300 of us with a total workforce of 2,500 people. People working hard and often successfully in changing habits, in changing investments, and in shaping the energy transition. The agencies can play a critical role in achieving the European energy and climate goals in our everyday contacts with citizens, businesses, the administrations and the politicians in our cities and regions. We explain, we motivate, we advise, we coach, we network, we finance, we plan, and many more things. Presenting the energy transition as something that is not only necessary, but it's viable and it's desirable. Manage Energy supports us in doing that and in expanding our services with a focus to triggering sustainable energy investments. Today, we're going to get the perspectives on the role of the local and regional level on the energy transition from two eminent speakers. And I have now the honor to introduce the very first speaker, Julien Guerry. He is the director of the Executive Agency for Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises, EASME, as it's known to all of us. The EASME is an organization that has become a true driver for innovation, sustainability, and the energy transition, and the important and valued partners for many of us here in this room. Monsieur Guerrier has worked in the European Commission for over 20 years, mostly on industrial policy and international trade, including a stay in Tokyo at the EU Japan Center. Before joining the Commission, he worked at the French Ministry of Public Works. Julien Guerrier will give us his perspective on the contribution of local action to the energy transition, and he will also share insights from the user so far. Julien, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much, Christiane. Good evening to all of you. Yesterday morning, we had the award ceremony uh, for the EU Sustainable Energy Awards, and many of the people shared extremely exciting stories. And what these stories tell us is that they make us realize how much cross-border cooperation, innovative thinking, and practical support, all combined, can really change our lives for the better. One of those stories that made the biggest impression on me and that I would like to, to share with you is the success story of the Regional Energy Agency of Northwest Croatia. 
This is an agency uh, that you know well, and I'm proud to say an agency that was already supported by the Intelligent Energy Program, uh, which is the first uh, program that our agency managed back in 2004-2009. Uh, in the 10 years that this uh, agency, Northwest Croatia, uh, has been operational, it has not only contributed to the energy transition in Croatia, which is important enough, but it has also inspired the change that is yet to come. Let me uh, explain that. It has, what I would say, lit the sparkle. And to mention three of its many actions, it has helped retrofit around 100 existing public buildings in the country. It has renewed Zagreb's street lightning. And it has launched a crowdfunding platform for sustainable energy products. Thanks to all of this, each year, the Agency of Northwest Croatia is achieving energy savings for more than 17 gigawatts hours. This is roughly the equivalent of the electricity used by almost 4,800 households in Zagreb during an entire year. So that is a real impact. And as you can see, local actors, regional actors, are the ones who explore who implement innovative, ambitious, and trans uh, transformative initiatives that can have this remarkable impact on energy transition. And it's to you, all of you, these actors, the regional uh, and local actors, that this talk this evening is dedicated to, because we think you are at the forefront of the energy transition. So tonight, what I would like to do is briefly focus on three important points. The first one is that the energy transition is happening at local level. I just gave an example. And the scale of commitment of local actors is impressive. I will give you a few figures. The second point I would like to underline is that our agency, EASME, the SME agency, is there to support your commitment with dedicated calls for proposals and other initiatives such as Manage Energy we are talking about tonight. And my third point is that we can all learn through the exchange of best practices between ourselves through cross-border cooperation. And that's what we are trying to do with events like the one of this week here in Brussels, where we uh, call on all actors to come from throughout Europe to meet with each other. Now, on my first point, energy transition is certainly not a simple endeavor. And it's not something that is going to happen overnight. It's definitively a challenge. And that's, uh, as we say for all, all challenges, one that we have to take bit by bit. Uh, you have to slice the elephant. And that's where you have a role to play. Because whatever we do at policy level to facilitate the energy transition, it's local and regional actors who ultimately will have to be called up to take up this challenge and to make it to make the change happen. Because the EU energy and climate targets are quite ambitious and are to be met as a whole through the actions that will be taken at local and regional level, the scale is of course important. And there we have also reassuring statistics showing us that the take up across Europe by regions and by local actors is extremely impressive. To give you a few examples, up to now we have more than 7,700 7, municipalities that have signed the Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy. More than 6,000 sustainable energy action plans have been drawn up as a, reason, as a, as a result of, of that. And this is going to bring long-term benefits when we uh, agglomerate all those actors to two 150 million citizens across the continent. So that's half the population of Europe. This is very impressive. This leads me to my second point and how we can at EASMA support you in what you are doing. Uh, this is because your action at local level is so important that we are focusing our calls for proposals on you and that we are uh, providing a never growing part of the budget under the energy efficiency part of Horizon 2020 uh, to, to such actions 
with a strong and dedicated focus on local and regional authorities. For example, there is currently an open call for proposals with three different topics of focus supporting public authorities on the creation of long-term transition roadmaps, the development of innovative business models to support the deep renovation of buildings, and the launch of concrete investment plans. I think it's really important to underline that because across Horizon 2020, which is an 80 billion program uh, for, for seven years, there are very few, if at all, other fields where we are targeting public authorities in our calls. So that's a sign of the importance that uh, you have in energy transition. Some of you are probably already working on the preparation of your proposals for this call. This is uh, going to be closed uh, on the 4th of September. We are there at EASME uh, with our project officers uh, to support you, to answer your questions. Uh, take advantage of all of us being here today and, and throughout the week. Uh, and there will be other calls in 2019 and in 2020 also dedicated to public authorities. So stay in touch with us, follow our website, and we will be there to support the best players, the ones who are selected, uh, and to help you make a difference at local level. Uh, that's a priority for us. Energy agencies have a role there because we think that they can be the catalyst that will make a real difference. First, there are trusted intermediaries who can facilitate the dialogue between public and private, technical and financial, political and executive. They are also flexible and they evolve and can respond to the market, meeting challenges and grasping new opportunities. And they have proven that they have a key role in aggregating smaller projects so as to build up sustainable investments uh, and support the vision and the values of the EU in the field of energy. A few months ago, uh, we were in another building here with several of you uh, here in Brussels to discuss precisely with investors and see how we can facilitate private investment in uh, energy efficiency and energy transition projects. In this context, this year we are relaunching the Manage Energy Initiative in support of 370 energy agencies, 2,500 staff in their ambition to become the leaders in energy transition at local level. One of our priorities with Manage Energy is that we want to help in the financial engineering of energy efficiency investment. We want to provide dedicated training, coaching that will achieve that. Now let me come to my third point and the message that I would really like to underline on the importance of collaborative project, cross-border collaboration, and exchange of good practices between all of you. We can all draw lessons from our projects, from the energy transition that is happening on the ground, and I'm very happy that this week, we have a whole week, as every year, dedicated to sustainable energy across the EU, where hundreds of participants can exchange their experience and give advice to, to each other, uh, build up new alliances for the future. This week, we learned, for instance, how some rural territories in Spain, Italy, and France are finding concrete ways to engage their citizens and boost energy transition. What they are doing is that they are strengthening the synergies between local actions and European policies. We also heard how the Ile-de-France region, the Paris region, thanks to a project called Positif, funded uh, by uh, the program, has already delivered on the renovation of 2,200 apartments worth 35 million euro of energy-related investments. That led also, on the side, to the creation of 600 jobs. This is particularly important these days, and when people are asking, what is the EU doing for me? Well, here, we have concrete examples. It's creating jobs, it's helping energy transition, it's helping making our life better and Europe a safer and more sustainable place. Ladies and gentlemen, our initiatives, our long-term vision at the agency is to motivate as many forerunners as you are in, as possible across Europe 
to develop their own energy transition projects, outlining the path that brings us all forward towards the achievement of the 2050 targets that we have set for the European Union. We are already witnessing the change every day in our private life. We know that we can be ambitious and that by building up on your local actions, we can deliver because we have the scale there uh, to achieve the, the targets. This afternoon, we heard other examples at the Energy Plans and Roadmaps for Sustainable Future Seminar, including the roadmap uh, for developing self-sufficient houses in South Bohemia, or the planning for the sustainable use of biomass in Spain and Greece. And that is really very encouraging. Many sessions showed us that our cities, our islands, our communities are already benefiting and starting to see the results of the ground. And that's where popular support will further grow and uh, uh, result in uh, the necessary political priority uh, to, to give to, to that. The Smart Cities and Communities Call has promoted, for instance, smart solutions adopted by EU cities that could be replicated at a bigger scale. The Urban Innovative Action has provi provided cities with the resources necessary to test new and unproven solutions to urban challenges. For instance, fossil-free districts in Gothenburg, in Sweden, or in Paris. And the Clean Energy for EU Islands has, through its secretariat, which has been launched today, uh, help already been helping islands reducing their dependency on imported fossil fuels and to generate their own sustainable, low-cost energy. So there are plenty of such examples. Uh, Maybe another one, the last one I would like to, to give you is the Energy Poverty Observatory in the EU that we have developed. Uh, energy poor households are still a reality uh, and this observatory is providing us with indicators, with resources, with guidance, evidence-based recommendations uh, that improve our knowledge on the lack of access to adequate energy services and we can de then uh, increase uh, the focus on practical and effective innovative solutions to enhance and facilitate social inclusion. So those are concrete examples and those are what we can deliver through our support in the agency to your action on the ground. Now before I close, I would like to congratulate you on your achievements, given a number of examples, but there are thousands of other ones. And I would like you really to encourage you to continue to be there, to innovate, not give up, and lead the energy transition on the ground in your regions. Take the future in your own hands. That's the message that we are trying to pass to you and through you to our citizens. Continue to lead, to share best practices, to take advantage of cross-border cooperation. Energy transition is not only a challenge, it's a huge opportunity, we saw that, to improve sustainability, but also social inclusion, create jobs, growth opportunities across Europe, and we want to be all part of that change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julien Garry, for your encouraging words and your insights. We will continue to work hard to be catalysts uh, for the energy transition in our cities, in our regions, uh, and hopefully always find responsive institutions here in Brussels that will help us be even stronger. Thank you very much. We now come to the keynote speech of this evening. I have the pleasure to welcome Rob Hopkins. Many of you will have heard from him. He is an environmental activist, a catalyst as well, a writer, a blogger, and a serial storyteller. He has many achievements to his name, co-founder of the Transition Movement and the Transition Down Totnes, four books, and in addition to his PhD, he was awarded with two honorary doctorates. In his talk, Rob will offer learnings from the Transition Movement and how bottom-up change can make very real impact. Give a hand of applause to welcome Rob Hopkins.
Thank you very much <clears throat> and good evening. Um, so I want to give a talk which I think of as a poem, uh, a love poem to the words what if, I suppose. I want to explore what if, but before I do that, I want to ask you to do something for me, which is if you could find somebody who you could be in a pair with. So have a look around, see who that person might be. Find a person you're going to be in a pair with just for a minute. Everybody got somebody? Sh sh shovel along if you're, if you're on your own and you need to find someone. So I'm going to show you a picture and you, of an object, which is an object that you see most days of your life, and you'll have one minute to think of as many different uses for it as possible. They can be sensible, they can be ridiculous. You don't have to think, is this economically feasible? Anything like that. Just ideas, and keep account of how many ideas you come up with. OK? Everybody happy? Does that make sense? OK. Go. The coffee cup. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to draw you to a halt. So, uh, put your hands up if you've got more than five. Very good. If you've got more than ten. Ah, oh, fifteen. Wow, very good. Does anybody, has anybody got one that they thought, I really hope we get the opportunity to share? That was so brilliant. I really hope we get the opportunity to share that with everybody. No, they were all mundane. Yes. To grab an insect. <laughs> oh, somebody else's was to grab an insect. Very good. Okay. Maybe one more. Yes? To use those shoulder pads and homemade Very nice. Very good. One more? To drink. To drink. Okay. <laughs> Pushing the boat out there. I did this in Sweden, and one of the a woman in the audience said, I would use it to keep the darkness in, which I still have strange dreams about. Anyway. <laughs> So the reason I wanted to start with that is that I love doing that because when I look around the room, when you're doing that, there is a kind of a spirit of, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a brightness, there's laughter, there's connection, people are connecting to each other, and that's the spirit for me about imagination, which is, what I, which is part of what I'd like to talk about this evening. This is the human brain, and I'm really interested, at the moment I'm researching a book about imagination and the, and the role of imagination in the shift that we need to see in that tiny window of time we have to make that shift. And this is a really important part of it. This is the, the hippocampus, part at the middle of the brain where when we're, when we're being imaginative, there are different networks that fire when we're being imaginative, but they all have the hippocampus at its center. And the health of the hippocampus is absolutely essential to us being uh, as imaginative as we can possibly be. And a while ago, I read some research by a woman called Kyung Hee Kim, an American researcher, who uh, had looked at something called the Torrance Test for Creative Thinking, which is the gold standard way of measuring creativity imagination. She had this data set that went back to the early 1960s, big, big data set. Her conclusion was that IQ and imagination rose together until 1990, at which point IQ continued rising, and imagination went into what she called a steady and persistent decline. And when this research was published, it was on the front page of Newsweek. There was a whole load of soul searching in America. What does this mean for economic growth? What does this mean for Hollywood? 
But I never heard anybody in the climate change, social justice, community activism world say, well, what does this mean for us? Because fundamentally what we're trying to do is to enable people to imagine a different way that the future could be. And maybe if it's not moving fast enough, rather than just thinking we have to campaign harder and lobby harder, maybe we need to explore that fundamental thing of do we have a challenge in terms of our imagination? Because it pops up in things like this, which is possibly the worst book I ever read in my whole life. My, my withering review of this can be found online if you want cheering up at some point. This kind of idea that actually uh, we can't imagine anything other than fossil fuels because fossil fuels have been really great. It's like saying, well, uh, uh, you know, the, the first three months of this deeply abusive relationship I'm in were really great, so maybe I should stick around in it, you know. This is, this is when we look at the, the relationship with fossil fuels we see coming out from lots of places, for me, that's a real uh, symbolism of when the imagination starts to evaporate. So why might it be? What might be some of the things that could be impacting our imagination at this time when we need to be at our most imaginative? Imagination, one of my favourite definitions of it is that vast and scintillating internal fountain of all things strange and new. And I think one of the reasons why is because of the decline of play in our society. And when I grew up, kids played out in the street all the time. You speak to adults now, 71% of them will tell you as children, they played out in the street. Now about 21% of children play out in the street. Our children are under what Richard Louvre, who wrote The Last Child in the Woods, calls, um, uh, what does he call it, I forgot, uh, uh, well-meaning protective house arrest. They start compiling their CV from the age of four. <laughs> and this was in my town where we had a street games festival, where we got the kids out in the street learning how to play street games again, learning to play with each other. But when we look at what, what capitalism is providing our children uh, for, f to feed their imagination, I went to the London Toy Fair as part of the research for this book I'm doing, and I was looking for this, which is Hello Barbie. Not that I wanted one for myself, but it was, it was uh, because this is the first of these sort of Wi-Fi enabled smart dolls. In Germany, these are actually classed as illegal espionage apparatus, and parents can be fined for turning the Wi-Fi on in these things. Well, if you could ever design the most perfect way to, 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 to destroy your child's imagination, you give them a doll that speaks to them using a 280-page script developed by Mattel. I think another of the things that is happening is, is, the, is the presence, the overwhelming presence of screens uh, in our life and the impact that that is having on our attention span. There's a brilliant book that just came out very recently by James Williams about attention. He says, the liberation of attention may be the defining moral and political struggle of our time. Its success is a prerequisite for the success of virtually all struggles. And I interviewed a neuroscientist who told me that he said uh, that he thought that our imagination went down in comparison to the amount of time we spent on our smartphones. You know, we have a real issue, I think, in terms of the amount of time we could be spending cultivating our imagination. We spend scrolling through uh, endless feeds. Also, we spend less and less time in nature. Our children spend less and less time in nature. And I think as well, we also are seeing what people call pre-traumatic stress disorder. When we live in a time during my lifetime, 50% of all of the wildlife we share this planet with has disappeared. We've lost 97% of the tigers, 75% of all the insects. And what impact does that have on our imagination when we live in a world where we see diversity dwindling? Does it encourage us to be more creative or do actually, do we, do, do we live in a state where our brains are, are, are in a state of anxiety and stress because of that? So to come back to our hippocampus, the thing with the hippocampus is that it is the part of the brain that is uniquely vulnerable to cortisol. When people uh, have post-traumatic stress, the hippocampus shrinks by about 20%. When children grow up in very traumatic childhoods, their hippocampuses are much smaller. And when your hippocampus is smaller, you get stuck in this sort of uh, inability to really imagine the future. The future shrinks and, and how you look at that. So my question is, how can we bring what if into this to try and tackle this? How can we really kindle the imagination at the community scale, which is what we've been doing for the last 12 years with the transition movement, now active in 50 countries around the world, thousands of communities, a self-organizing movement of people who are trying to bring that question of what if to life where they live. This is a place in London called Tooting. 
There's nothing particularly remarkable about Tooting, uh, but it has a very active, vibrant transition group in the middle of London. They have a long street. They don't have anywhere you would call a village green or a square or a central place where they, people could come together. So the transition group said, what if that bus turning circle was our village green? It's a circle normally full of buses, engines on all day, just sitting there. They said, what if that was our village green? And actually, not just what if, we're going to turn it into that for the day. So they closed the street, they, 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 they had food, they had music, they had flowers, they had drummers from, from the Sikh temple, and they spent the day living as though that had already happened. The beautiful thing about it was that it started to open up more what if questions. People, for the first time, sitting in their village green, which had grass and everything, um, could, were sitting for the first time and saying, I've never noticed that wall before. What will we paint on there? When this is our village green, what will we paint on there? So by asking the right what-if question, you open up more what-if questions. It becomes something that builds a kind of a momentum of possibility, which is something that we see again and again with these sort of projects locally. And there's something that I love about, about that idea of how do we bring the future into the present. We live at a time when we are surrounded by dystopias, by stories about how awful the future is going to be. Almost every film in the cinema is telling us how awful the future is going to be. Well, where are the stories about actually how completely fantastic the future could be if we get this stuff right? And how do we bring into people's everyday life a taste of that so people can see what that might feel like? This is something I heard about recently in America, which I love, called Parking Day, where what they do is people come out in, in in towns and cities, and they, they, they look at parking spaces as if they, they call them low-rent performance spaces. So what they do is they go and they buy a parking ticket for that space for the day, and then they turn it into something else. So, so, so no cars can park there because they've filled it up with other things, and they've paid for a ticket, so it's fine. They bought the space for the day. They can, they can do what they like. So they might turn it into a, into a sort of a sitting space made with recycled things. They might turn it into a place for people to do yoga, possibly. They could use it for playing bool by the side of the road. They could play Connect Four on the big sort of Connect Four. And I love that idea that actually we find those ways to give people a taste and a feel and a sense of, of, of how it could be. This is uh, uh, some drawings that, that Quentin Blake, who is one of my favorite artists in the whole world, did in a maternity hospital uh, in France, in Angers. And his brief was to, 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 to give women arriving at the maternity hospital a time when they're very anxious and very stressed, uh, a different experience. He calls these the... Um, he says they are a celebration of what's going to happen and a reassurance that it is going to happen. So they're paintings of the first time uh, the mother meets, meets their child. They're beautiful. The first time I saw them, they made me cry. They're absolutely beautiful. Uh, but it's that sense of how do we give people a taste of actually how the future could be in, in the time now. And that's one of the things that we do a lot of in transition. So one of my favorite what-if questions I came across recently was this project happening in London, which said, um, actually, in London, uh, this is a map of London just showing the green spaces and the blue spaces and no buildings. So they said, actually, 47% of London is green space, and 2.5% of London is blue space, park, uh, lakes, rivers. If we could just make one, uh, another half a percent, then the majority of London would actually be green and blue space. So they said, what if London were a national park? They produced this beautiful map uh, that showed that. And just that question, what if London were a national park, which is going to happen next year. London will be designated a national park city. The idea is that every citizen in London, if they took a metre square and turned it green, then that would be enough. So there's a beautiful way of engaging schools, engaging children. And when I spoke to Daniel Raven Ellis, who does this project, I asked him, how do you turn a what-if question into a project like this? And he said that you use tools to awaken people's imaginations. It might be maps or photography or images and being really positive. Get artists, poets, culture makers involved straight off. Get it out of the environmental movement as quickly as possible. It is culture and people that will drive change. 
This is a, a, a project that I went to visit last week, which, which I think is just brilliant. So some of you will have, you'll have seen the, 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 at the beginning, I had a picture of the David Bowie £10 note, one of the most famous local currency uh, notes from Brixton in London. These are the, this is recently the Lake District launched the Lake District Pound as a currency for that whole region. These local currencies are happening all over the place. But this is a project which is slightly different. And this comes back to what I was saying about cortisol, because cortisol in communities shuts down possibility. It shuts down imagination. That cortisol that comes from stress, anxiety, fear. And actually, how can we find, if we want to do transition properly, meaningfully in a place, we want to engage as many people as possible in thinking positively. That's where we want to go. I think one of the things we need to do is identify where are the pockets of cortisol in that place. Where are, what are the things that are driving the cortisol? And one of the things is debt. And that sort of toxic debt uh, that people get into, we see a lot of it in the UK at the moment with the government's austerity agenda, which is pushing lots of people into, into toxic spirals of debt. How, so this project starts with a what if question. What if this community were able to come together and come, have a creative way to try and tackle that problem? So they found an empty bank. They took over an empty bank. And they turned it into the People's Bank. They called it a, a, an act of citizen money creation. They printed these notes. They're not a local currency. You can't spend them. They're like limited edition artworks. And they print them in the bank. They have printers in the bank. Anybody can call, call in any time and see this money being printed in the bank. Absolutely beautiful. Screen printed, block printed, just lovely, lovely works of art. The people on the notes are really interesting. So this is saying, who in this place do we want to recognize as being our heroes? Who are the people who are stepping up and trying to, tr trying to bring the imagination to how, what we do now? These two guys run a project which keeps young people from getting involved in gangs. This guy, Gary, he mortgaged his house in order to set up a local food bank to help local people who couldn't eat. This is the head teacher at the local primary school who lost all of their funding for the arts. And this family here run a kitchen where every day they feed 200 people f free meals twice a day. Uh, and actually, so the idea is that they want to print and sell 50,000 pounds worth of these notes. Half of that money will be divided between these four charities, but the other half, they will go to the secondary debt market and use it to buy back a million pounds worth of debt in that neighborhood and cancel that debt. When I heard about that, I thought it was so smart. Absolutely brilliant. And as a way of trying to bring the kind of, uh, trying to look at how you shift the, the, the cortisol out of the community, I think it's just brilliant. This is in uh, Les Mureaux, which is the suburb of Paris, one of the banlieues, where a while ago there were big riots and it's, and it's sort of, a lot of its reputation is around that. I went there last year where they were starting to do transition and they had a beautiful what if question. They said, what if Les Mureaux was a tourist destination? What if people came to Les Mureaux on holiday? And they've set up all kinds of things to facilitate that, where people can come and have meals with different families and they're growing food. But it's a beautiful what if question that is opening up so much possibility in terms of how they're looking at their future. So the last story that I want to tell you is from Liège, up, up the road. So I went to Liège about four years ago when Liège en transition were quite young. They'd been going for a couple of years and they'd started some different projects. And they had this what if question. What if, in a generation's time, the majority of the food grown, uh, eaten in Liège was grown on the land closest to Liège? So they invited together scientists and academics and chefs and anyone who cared about food at all for a series of events, and I was there for the first one of those. And then I didn't really hear anything uh, for three or four years. So then I came, I came home, and then I went back there about two months ago. And in that time, they've started 14 cooperatives. Uh, so a farm, two, two vineyards, a brewery, a delivery business, a mushroom growing business, this shop, which is called Le Petit Producteur, and in the Petit Producteur, they, they, they sell food produced by local farmers. Those 14 cooperatives raised 5 million euros in investment from local people. When I met with uh, this man, Pascal here, he manages the shops, I said, what's the ambition with, with this? He said, well, we started the first shop, and within a couple of months, we were way ahead of our best case scenario, so we opened a second shop. We want to open 10 shops, we feel by the time we get to maybe 12 or 13, the supermarkets will start to fragilize. 
which isn't a word that really works in English, but it kind of also really does work really nicely in English. So the supermarkets will start to fragilize. And the beautiful, uh, what I loved about it there was when I was there, I met the mayor, and the mayor of, of Liège said, eight years ago, we wanted to be a smart city. Now we want to be a transition city. We own a whole load of land around the city. We're making that land available to young people who want to get into farming. And so you're starting to see this kind of momentum. You know, what we've seen over the last 50 years, that move towards monoculture has been a shutting down of imagination, a shutting down of possibility. What I see again and again when I visit places doing transition with vibrant local food markets and new economies starting to emerge is that when you start to move back in the other direction, all manner of possibilities open up and, and, and all sorts of things become, become possible. And you see that, and this is a city, the city of Preston in the north of England, where the city of Preston uh, was economically really in a hole. And they invited together the, the, the seven key organizations who spend public money, 750 million pounds a year, and they said, what if we did this differently? And where does the money go at the moment? Nobody knew. So they found that only 4% of the money they spend actually goes into the economy of Preston, the rest of it leaves. So they're now changing the whole model, bringing their pension funds back, changing how they do tendering, setting up cooperatives to supply the hospitals with food and energy and laundry and all that kind of thing, based on that model that we want to keep the money here. But again, it comes back to that big, asking the, the, the really bold what if question. So I want to leave you with this. I was in Lyon recently, driving through Lyon. And I saw this out of the window, and I thought it was beautiful. It, look, it looked to me like the dustbin and the bollard are star-crossed lovers, <laughs> completely in love with each other underneath the starry sky. The dustbin, if, if it could purr, I imagine it would be purring like a cat. And, uh, uh, and, and so to me, it was just a little moment that I saw out the window. But actually, all that took was a couple of dots and a line on that bollard. And my experience is that when you work in the community, if you find the right little interventions that you can make that can really open up people's imaginations, people's sense of what's possible, then things really start to move uh, very, very quickly. And having that sort of trust that that will happen so you don't try and control it all, but really giving people the permission to, to, to come up with those questions is a really key part of how we're going to navigate the next 10 or 15 years. So thank you very much for your time, and uh, I'll look forward to any questions afterwards. Thank you. Do we go down or uh, At the moment, maybe you go back. So thanks so much, Rob, for inspiring talk and the dose of motivation for all of us in our daily struggle. Uh, so we make imagination uh, a, a, a required element in all the tr transformation uh, roadmaps. So that we have to start by imagine, starting by imagining what our energy future could be. Thank you very much for planting this picture in our head. So now we have a few moments to ask questions from our two speakers. Do we have anyone wanting to ask a question? If yes, please raise your hand. Yes, we, we have uh, one in the back. Do we have one? Do we have another one? Yes, two. Uh, so we collect these two. Please, uh, when you start, maybe you give us your name and the organization you work for. Yeah, hello, my name is Vlasta Krmele and I'm working at the energy agency of Podravje in uh, Slovenia. So I would like to have a small question and a big answer from uh, Mr. Julien. Uh, we heard about the inspiration on the end, so can you give us a little bit of your thoughts where you see energy agencies in 10 years or in 20 years? Okay, super question, thank you. And the second question, can we get the micro? Hi, um, my name is Stefan Renner, I work for, with Julia and uh, as a project officer in the ASME. And my what if question would of course be what, would, what if the city would have less cars? Evidemment, because it's uh, it's just uh, living in Brussels. It's uh, just uh, imagining a city differently would also include maybe less tunnels or just you know 
different uh, structure of the city. For this, uh, I, I think it's crucial when you work on a local level, as I do as an activist in Vienna, the 17th district in Hanoi, uh, uh, so it's important to work with them. But for that, you need the energy agencies, uh, I guess, so much. And we are so happy to have so many energy agencies to work. Uh, so, um, so, uh, so active. My question would be for your work as a transition. So, so you, 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 you use the word transition city. Uh, do you work with energy agency and, and what kind of support do you get from them? Thank you. And we have a third question. Yeah. Thank you, Christian. Adrian Joyce uh, from <coughs> the European Alliance of Companies for Energy Efficiency in Buildings. A question for Rob Hopkins. Rob, uh, you're here in the middle of one of the most important policy conferences that the EU puts on each year. And I want to ask you a what if question. What if there was no European policy? How would the world look like? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so maybe we start with a question on the future of energy agencies where you see us. And can we have the micro? Yes. Here? Or maybe you, you do it from... Oh, here it is. Great. Okay. Well, I, I talked a lot about uh, cross-border cooperation, and what I would like to see in 10 years is to have a real ecosystem across the EU of all agencies meeting together, exchanging, working together, and driving the energy transition. Do you hear me? Even it doesn't work driving the energy transition. What we will do on our end, uh, you may know that we are proposing now as the Commission uh, the next generation of funding programs for Europe 2021-2027. And in particular, I would like to, to, to underline one other program that we are managing in EASME, the LIFE program, which will be almost doubled in terms of financing, and despite the withdrawal of one of our biggest member states, uh, I mean, that's in our proposal. We will see what happens after the negotiation with the parliament and the member states, but that's still, it's a very encouraging starting point. And this LIFE uh, program will finance a, a very large number of actors at local level. So we will still be there to support you, but what I would like to see is a, is a lively and self-sustained, I would say, uh, ecosystem of regional agencies uh, driving the uh, energy transition in Europe. Thank you. So we start by imagining cooperative member states. Uh, <laughs> that's tackling it really hardly. And now the second question, Sue Rob. The, se the two questions. Uh, the, the mic, I think it's mine. He has it. Is it still on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite warm up here. Um, so they're both quite tricky questions because that's your whole field and I'm coming from a different field. So, uh, you know, uh, if there were no EU energy policy, that would be really terrible because actually policy, uh, the, because we need... So the, the bit that always really intrigues me with, with transition is what, what it looks like when the top down and the bottom up meet each other. Mm -hmm. And it was a thing that, r that r I loved in Liège was, was, was talking to the mayor there and he was saying, this is the new story of the city. We didn't start it. You know, for the first few years, I think they were a bit suspicious and a bit this is just going to fizzle out and now they can see the momentum that they own all this land around Liège they're basically saying to Centur Alimentaire this land is is for you to let to the people who you think are going to help drive this forward you know and we have in transition network now we have a whole initiative called municipalities in transition because we see communities across uh, ac across Europe and, and further afield who are who are making all kinds of amazing stuff happen sometimes with their municipality sometimes independent of their municipality we also see people at municipality level who love transition and they've read the books and seen the films and they're all really excited about it and who say, we don't have any transition groups here. How do we get them started? And then we see places where, where the top and the down meet, each, the top down and the bottom up meet each other, what Olivier de Scooter calls the partner state. You know, when you start to see the partner state, when politicians say, what are the obstacles? How can we get them out of the way? So you have a strong energy policy. You also have that policy as much as possible saying, we need to enable local economies to be the drivers of this. That's when it gets really exciting for me. Um, and do transition groups work with energy agencies? Um, I'm sure they probably do. I don't have any, who asked that? Like, uh, yeah, um, I, don't, I don't have any stories off the top of my head. I know that in, 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 in the UK we had 
about five or six years ago, the Transition Network worked with the government to create a community energy strategy. The first time the UK ever had a community energy strategy because transition groups and others all across the country, there was this explosion of community energy projects that were just fantastic. So then the government worked with us to, to create this community energy strategy. And then they just decided that community energy and renewable energy was terrible and they cut all the tariffs and that whole really promising emerging community-led sector would just died over the space of about six months and some of the bigger ones are still going and are doing really well but all those ones that were just getting started and using the feed-in tariff as a driver for, for, for changing the local economy were just sort of uh, squashed by one stroke of policy making so um, yeah but I'm sure there are some I'm sure there are some thank you Rob and I think that uh, brings us uh, to the end of this very interesting and thought-provoking uh, small event. I would like to conclude by saying thank you to European Commission and the ESME for this event, but in general for their support to us agencies in becoming leaders in the energy transition. The colleagues at the ESME, uh, the Manage Energy team, uh, who we enjoy very much working with, my colleagues at the Manage Energy Initiative, uh, FEDEREN, the European Federation of Local and Regional Energy Agencies, uh, REGEA and LIT. The two speakers uh, for their great talks and their insights, and you, of course, for joining us tonight. I would like to end with two invitations. One, to join the Manage Energy community on our websites and our social media channels anytime. And right now, to join us for a cocktail in the patio. Together, local, na regional, national, and European actors, we can team up, top down and bottom up, and work hard for creating a united Europe and an energy transition that we need and that we want. Thank you very much.